Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, GTX 680 or Overclock 7970, Hall of Fame versus Lightning GPUs. LG's got flexible monitors. Smartphones are taking over. Is Best Buy in trouble decorating your GPU? And where did all the portrait displays go? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 163, recorded March 29th, 2012. Flexible monitors and Hall of Fame GPUs. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show where we go over the newest and exciting news in computer hardware, then we answer your questions about how to make your hardware and occasionally your software, and once in a while your tablets or mobile devices work better and faster or just plain work. Joining us as always, Mr. Ryan Shrout, who I believe is on the road in anticipation of the final four this weekend. Ryan. Well, it happened. It so happens I'm on the road. I'm actually on a uh, on a on a golf trip with my dad in St. Augustine, Florida. <gasps> I have one of my closest friends lives in St. Augustine. Oh, really? I yes. love it here. It's great. Uh, we've had a lot of fun. Weather has been perfect. And uh, you are correct, though. We are leaving uh, late Friday night or early Saturday morning to drive to New Orleans. It was kind of a surprise. Uh, my cousin and I got tickets for us and our fathers to go to the Final Four, all dependent on them actually going to the Final Four. So, uh, so far, so good. So, I, I thought, so it's, uh, it's the, what do they call the, the Sweet Eight? Because you can tell I'm very good at sports football. The Elite Eight, yes. Elite Eight. So they're in the Elite yes. Eight now, and it's it's is it actually Kentucky versus Louisville to get into the Final Four? No, it's it's Kentucky and Louisville in the Final Four to get to the championship game. Oh, my God. So, so it's even worse. Uh, the state of Kentucky is kind of in this froth of <laughs> anger at each other, right? You have to pick a side. There's no, like, kind of uh, halfway one way or the other. So Apparently, the, the you're going to you're gonna probably not laugh but like npr was talking about this today as i'm like driving from point a to point b and that's when i called you because i'm like wait which team are we rooting for and uh <laughs> talked about two guys that were in a dialysis center and apparently got into a fist fight <laughs> over yes, louisville versus that. kentucky <laughs> i saw that i thought i saw that that story's been making its round on the on this on the kentucky blogs and that kind of stuff it's actually i thought i thought it was pretty hilarious myself uh, <laughs> you're sitting there strapped to your artificial kidney and all of a sudden you uh people make me laugh dude i asked you another thing we were talking about earlier today where's the 680 right 680 highest performing card out there and we take a look at the pc per leaderboard and, and we get to the mm -hmm. dream system the ultimate system the amazing i have the mad cash system and the 680 is not there and one of the things i asked you was you know it's, so you've got the 7970 up there is the radon ht 7970 the card of choice for your ultimate system on the hardware leaderboard because of the total lack of availability uh of of the the gtx 680 right now so that's 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 pretty accurate actually um you know keep in mind that it's been it, it pretty much it's been exactly a week since the 680 was launched uh we talked about it last week on the show uh quite a bit so we won't even really touch much on it but it is my new favorite card in terms of a high-end product for gamers uh, if you look at our uh, the, the dream system, I think, is it in the high end system too? Uh, I believe, the 7970? I think the 7950 is in the high end system. Okay, okay. Um, so on the dream system, you know, the, the price of that card is 560 bucks. Well, the, the, the 680s were actually $60 less than that. Um, so it, it may find its way both into the dream system and the high end system. Nice. The issue is, of course, the availability. Um, now, it, NVIDIA, of course, is talking it up because it's very happy that it sold out all of its parts. Um, but uh, obviously, consumers that want to buy one now aren't so happy. <laughs> I, I was told by a couple of people in NVIDIA that the, the shipment, there will be a shipment available the first week of April. Mm -hmm. So anytime from the next couple of days and on, that is actually going to be bigger than the initial launch allotment of graphics cards. Okay. So if you're interested in getting a 680, you should definitely be like kind of, you know, 
bookmarking and checking back to Newegg or, or checking on Twitter feeds of people who follow that stuff uh, pretty frequently. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll update it when they're back in stock. But uh, it, it's it's it was basically to the point of you know ha- had these still been in stock a couple of days later we would have updated the leaderboard. But because right. They sold out in a matter of 12 hours or less. They sold out. We never even had a chance to update the leaderboard. I was going to say. Oh, sorry. Oh, Newegg sold out in an hour. A friend of mine who who had been waiting for the 680 for weeks, um, you know, was basically sitting like every half an hour refreshing his browser, got a 680 and went to buy a second one for somebody else's system. And they were out like less than an hour later. Now, NVIDIA did give me some kind of numerical information on how many cards they have sold um i don't i don't know it's somewhere in the ballpark of ten thousand, right. which which is actually a, a, a really high number if they actually sold that many cards in one day um, especially for a 500 hundred dollar video card now i, I think probably 7970 and 7950 are beyond that now mm-hmm. um but it'd be interesting it, it's tough to get super accurate numbers nobody really wants to share it right uh, specifically even whether they're in the lead or if they're behind but I, I'm going to guess that the 680 is going to probably pretty quickly catch up to the 7970 mm-hmm. in terms of just total sales, you know. And then we'll see if AMD ever, you know, will respond with that with with price reductions and stuff. Is is the when we start looking at the the volume of cards that are shipping, we're talking about 10,000 or 100,000 starts to look really good for a high end card. At what point mm-hmm. do we start getting into millions of cards sold, or is it, or is the cold reality is that majority of computers these days are just running sort of the onboard graphics? Uh, on the CPU. Oh, sure. I mean, the, the majority of them are running onboard graphics still. When, I mean, but you'll sell millions of GTX 560s. Okay. You'll sell millions of 7800s, I think, in the long run, in the long term as well. Um, but for, for a $500 video card to sell 10,000 units mm-hmm. in one day, if that's true, is actually is actually really, really good. It's very, very strong. And, um, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm you know, being too praise, putting too much praise on NVIDIA. But the truth is they sold out at an hour. Um, I think they could have sold out in 24 hours had they priced it at 599. So, uh, you know, you, you might look at it. Are they doing uh, a favor necessarily for the, for the enthusiasts and the consumers trying to get both a little goodwill and a good branding bit by, by keeping the price lower than the uh, 7970, even though they didn't really have to, but when you look at performance and features and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's cool. Cool is good. Speaking of cool, yeah. MSI R7970 Lightning, the Lightning series from MSI has traditionally been one of your favorite series of GPUs out there. Um, <laughs> running, I want to say running overclocked at 1070 slash 1400, the 7970 from MSI. How did it, I mean, did it live up to the expectations you were, you were holding for it? Actually, yeah. So Josh actually did this review. The base clock of the 7970 is 925 megahertz. This one is running at 1070. Um, so a, a pretty healthy stock overclock. Um, this this card is really MSI's like super high end model. If, if you're just looking to plug in a card and play games, you know, you can buy one of these, but I think you might be wasting some of it. This is somebody who wants to overclock it and tweak it and get a little further. I think they set some kind of uh, GPU clock speed record with this card in, in uh, LN2 as well. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of uh, of the of the target audience maybe for the for the lightning edition cards it's only fifty dollars more expensive than your standard seventy nine seventy which is nice mm-hmm. it does run much much cooler than your standard seventy nine seventy the cooler the 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 super pipe based uh, twin frozer cooler that MSI has designed and they've used for several generations of cards is really really good stuff. Um, now, Josh did have some problems with this card initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't running stable even at its base clocks. There's actually a switch on top that has two modes. It allows you to enable LN2 overclocking mode versus standard mode. And LN2 overclocking mode kind of uh, increases voltages and decreases or increases tolerances and that kind of stuff above what it might otherwise do. Um, and it would run stable in LN2 mode, but not in the standard mode, which was obviously a problem. Now, they sent an updated BIOS just uh, like three or four days before the review went live, and it fixed all of the problems. So there's a chance that some consumers will get the, the incorrect BIOS, but MSI is already committed to getting that new BIOS out there and post it on their site should anybody have any problems. Now, what was interesting, if we look at, let's see... Where's the overclocking results here on the last page? Um, it, you know, just real quick on that page, it shows the, the load temperature never got above 70 degrees Celsius 
Wow. Which is uh, actually 65 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry. It's the bottom mark there. Um, so five degrees cooler than, than last generation's car, which is, which is pretty impressive. Um, so uh, it says without voltage increases, the GPU was able to hit 1120 megahertz, completely stable. Um, that essentially translates into 15 to 20% better performance, um, which when you... You know, when we do our G- when we did our GTX 680 testing, we were basically doing reference versus reference, right? So the the, the base card that you get that's 499 from Nvidia, and the base card you get that's 549 from AMD. When you get these overclock cards, this card is actually able to outperform the GTX 680 in the majority of the cases in our testing. So, you know, we're at the point where an overclocked model card is going to be able to kind of jump over the base model of the other one. And now we'll see the overclocked GTX 680 cards probably in a few weeks, which will, of course, jump over that. Um, so we, we, just in general, I kind of like to compare the reference performance to the reference performance cards for that. But if you like to <laughs> overclock and you like to tweak, this is, this is a really good card to have. Still keeping in mind that it's $50 more expensive than the standard 7970. This is a $599, $599 card, which puts it $100 higher than the GTX 680. So it's hard for me to, to get uh, like real excited about recommending this to people. Mm-hmm. But if you're an AMD enthusiast, you love the, the, 70, the 7000 series products and what they've done, this is probably the best 7970 that exists now. Right. So that's, that is worth something. So the GTX 680, of course, comes out, sells out. We haven't seen a whole lot of sort of specialty cards around the GTX 680 yet. Um, Mm -hmm. And one of the earliest ones we've seen so far, uh, PC Per, uh, uh, basically has some great pictures from uh, expreview.com, which is a Chinese site. And they're talking about Galaxy, who's going to be delivering a four gigabyte, uh, heavily overclocked Hall of Fame edition of the GTX 680. (laughs) First of all, I think Hall of Fame is the best name for a GPU ever. Um, second of all, uh, is anything, you know, overclocking, so we're going to watch, like we just talked about, the 7970 overclocked takes it past a reference, a, a, a.k.a. stock, a standard version of the 680. Um, so we can assume that the overclock 680 will leapfrog the overclock 7970, depending on how right. brutal the overclocking is. Are there any games out there right now that are actually going to take advantage of 4 gigabytes of DDR? <sighs> I would say there, four gigabytes of memory is only really useful in multi-display configurations. Got it. I think that's I think that's a fair thing to say, right? Um, there will be some some kind of fringe cases where more memory will 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 give you better performance, maybe smoother frame rates, a little bit more consistent stuff. frame rates. What's that? Maybe with CUDA core activities where you're using it for yeah for rendering on a on a third party application or something. Yes, that that would be another good example of that. So, yeah, I mean, this this is basically a post kind of demonstrating here here's some of the the non reference non stock non standard designs that are coming out. Four gigabytes, highly overclockable, custom cooler designs. Uh, you can see the picture of this one. The Galaxy card has uh, three fans. It also has that weird PCB extension on the bottom of it, um, which I don't know if that will actually ship with it or not. I'm guessing not. It would be kind of cool if it did. It kind of adds a little bit more stability to the card mm-hmm. since they are, they're, you know, they're they're pretty long. Um, but um, yeah, this this is this is a pretty cool little. Uh, collection of hardware here so you know the, the one the one feature the one check mark check box type item that the 7970 still has over the 680 is three gigabytes of frame buffer versus two gigabytes and you know we did our benchmarking of the 680 we talked about it last week and it doesn't really necessarily represent a whole lot in terms of a specific performance but there are people that are going to say well this one has more memory this will give me more headroom into the future. I want to use that one. Uh, and, and by offering four gigabyte models, they'll be able to you know, get past that mentality. We'll, I'll be curious to see how much this actually increases the prices because this is, the 680 is the first GPU to offer 1500 megahertz memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and you know, if you're going to double that cost, essentially, in, in, in RAM chips, then you're going to have to... I'm curious to see how much more expensive it'll be because it looks like Galaxy is going to offer both kind of a... A, a standard clocked four gigabyte version and then a highly overclocked four gigabyte version. Hmm. And uh, if we look at the, the stock prices, we might be able to see kind of what that extra cost is going to be. There you have it. 
Samsung uh, 830, the latest edition of Samsung's uh, SSD drives. It's kind of funny. Like Samsung's been around for SSDs for a while, but we usually don't think about it. We think about OCZ. We think about Intel. And it looks like from Alan's review that the 830 is probably really a compelling competitor to both uh, OCZ and Intel. Intel uh, with the 520 having a longer, like a five-year warranty versus a three-year yep. warranty on the 830. Um uh, but the uh, the IOPS, the uh, input-output operations per second, looking really solid on the Samsung. And one of the things Alan notes is that the Samsung controllers traditionally maybe weren't as fast, but they didn't slow down over time um, as, uh, right. as fragmentation uh, kicked in on an SSD. And now that Samsung's actually stepped up and delivered uh, some pretty serious performance. But, you know, quote, not the fastest, but as a testament to their consistency, I continue to use one of the two aforementioned G-Skill drives in the PC per storage testbed to this day, basically talking about the Samsung uh, chipset on there. Mm -hmm. um, he sounds really happy with these, and it's interesting. If, if you have the scratch for a 512-gigabyte uh, 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 SSD drive, um, you're looking at a pretty good deal because th I think they're streeting on Newegg for about $700 for 512 gigabytes versus 800 to well over uh, close to $900 for most of the other brands of uh, SSDs in that capacity. Yeah, it's interesting. That's actually one of the few uh, SSDs that actually gets less expensive the higher capacity you get. Mm -hmm. Less expensive in terms of price per gigabyte, obviously. Right. Uh, the higher capacity you get, most of the time it's there's kind of like in, in the middle sweet spot and then it's a little bit more expensive at the low end, a little bit more expensive at the higher end. This one's not necessarily the case. Um, what's, what I found most interesting is we talked on the podcast last night mm -hmm. and Alan said that this would probably take over his recommendation as his, his favorite GPU. This or the Intel uh, 520, I guess is what he mm -hmm. said. Um, and just in terms of whichever one you can find the best price on. Right. would probably be his favorite type of thing. And right now that is the Samsung 830. Um, you know, and, and you can see there they're showing up there that the price is per gigabyte on that kind of stuff. And I think one of the things that's really interesting, if you look at this, Samsung introduced a firmware update that uh, uh, I think it was it Samsung did this, that they updated a firmware update that drastically improved performance uh, and 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 came away really impressed with it. So, uh, you know, we, we reviewed three different versions of it because each capacity has slightly different performance characteristics. So you can go there and see uh, which, which, which capacity maybe has the, the highest IOPS or the best reads and write speeds, depending on your use case and that kind of stuff. And then obviously, of course, of your budget as well. You can see the 256 gig version of the 830. He tested 64, 128, and 256. And 256 was the fastest of the three, just in terms of raw burst read speeds and write speeds. So, nice. yeah. Uh, but yeah, like you said, if you have the scratch to pay for it, the best quote value is the highest end model <laughs> available. But, uh, you know, well, it's not often. Yeah. It, it's not often you get to say that, right? On GPUs, the price per frame, right? you know, if we use that type of metric, uh, goes up as you it go to higher end video cards um, and, and processors and all that kind of stuff as well for, in the majority of cases. So interesting, interesting to see. I just like the idea that 128 gigabyte SSDs are, are, can be had for well under $200, which I can think of at least one more system in my house that may be getting an SSD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From the uh, GWiz department, LG says Engadget is going to be unveiling flexible plastic e-paper displays uh, in Europe next month. Um, if you haven't seen this, it's pretty insane. E-paper, of course, differing from a traditional notebook uh, LCD in that you basically you flick the pixel um, to dark or light, and it stays that way until you power it up again. That's why the power consumption is so low. Um but it's been funny because we've been we've been waiting for sort of flexible roll up, tuck in your pocket, foldable displays, and obviously this isn't going to be something that's particularly pocket friendly in the terms of folding it up or rolling it up. You can see the big controller bar sticking up the uh, off the, the the left side and top side of the panel there. So obviously this will go in probably some kind of a book sized case. Um, but it has the possibility of being flexible. Uh, 1024 by 768, not a spectacular resolution, but can bend at an angle up to 40 degrees. 
So a third thinner than similarly specced glass displays and weighs in at 14 grams, about half the weight of its glassy competition. LG also claims the display is super durable, as evidenced by a series of successful drop tests from heights of 1.5 meters. Uh, ODMs <laughs> are going to pick it up in China. Um, and apparently in the hopes of bringing final product to Europe by next month. So it's not quite the flexible display in the gee whiz sci-fi sense of it, but the idea is that you have a display. It's close. Just, yeah, and they can put it under plastic, and it should be relatively bomb-proof as far as e-readers go. Um, Does this just allow um, OEMs to build uh, d- designs and systems and gadgets that have different form factors now? They don't necessarily have to have just a, a perfectly flat screen? That's my thought. Uh, I'll be curious to see whether or not, because it, it's also funny because while we think of, you know, I can, you start thinking like, okay, we can make a flexible case because the display can bend up to 40 degrees. The problem is components like batteries, you know, we could put a really thin PCB on the side of the case. Maybe, you know, can they wrap the battery around the edge of the case? I, mm-hmm. I, I think this is mostly the fact that it's it bends because it's plastic but the fact that it's plastic and lighter and thinner and more resistant to breakage is much more important than the fact that it bends um i I, I think this is kind of a step on our way to getting that incredible display that we can you know roll into a tube and stuff into our pocket or something like that um but yeah it's uh quote as slim as cell phone protective film and a flexible design that allows bending blah 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 it's an interesting idea uh, and in the fact that it's light. Um, but the, I think the key thing is if you look at the uh, original LG announcement, ebook users have long expressed a desire for a more durable EPD since around 10% of them have damaged their product screens from accidentally dropping or hitting them. So they spend yeah, a lot. That's, l- that's, uh, that's a pretty common occurrence, <laughs> I guess, right? So that's uh, I think that's the big thing for LG is like, hey, you know, we are uh, an electronic uh paper display that doesn't break as easy. Um, Some worth mentioning really quickly, uh, Nielsen Wire uh, was reporting that uh, half, we've talked a lot about ARM processors kind of taking over and ARM being incredibly important to the future of computing because, you know, small portable cell phones, smartphone type devices are where so much of the world is going to be actually interfacing with the internet and using uh, computer programs. And smartphones now account for half of all mobile phones, uh, in the U.S., up like 38% uh, from last year. In February 2011, only 36% of mobile subscribers own smartphones. Now, 49.7% of U.S. cell phone users have smartphones. Uh, so it went in, up from 38% in February of last year to 50% in February of this year. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm with a group of individuals. Uh, <laughs> there's, it's, a, it's a golf trip of 10 guys, and only my cousin and I aren't retired. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the age groups that we are <laughs> that we are dealing with here, and uh, I think of them of the uh, eight of them, two of them have smartphones. Two of them have right. smartphones. The rest of them are clinging, <laughs> clinging to those flip phones um, with every ounce of their strength. Right? They don't want to. They don't want to have to move over. Uh, but uh, yeah, this this whole you know the 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 metric here is impressive it gives you an idea of why a company as big as intel with with as great of profits as intel is so mm-hmm. worried about what a company like qualcomm can do qualcomm being the right. largest um you know cell phone soc manufacturer or designer rather in the world um so uh yeah it's we're we're going to have to pay closer attention to it, and it's something that everybody in the computer hardware world needs to needs to understand quite a bit better. Yeah, it's it's, it's why people are so excited about gaming on the iOS platform. Speaking of which, the, one other thing that was in the Nielsen article, um, they're looking at currently February two thousand twelve, forty eight percent of all smart smartphone owners are running Android, thirty two percent iOS, twelve percent RIM BlackBerry, and eight percent. Uh, just a mixed bag of operating systems. But what's interesting is if you're watching the podcast, if you're watching the video from the podcast, um, in terms of the the column on the right is the three-month recent acquirers. And what that's basically telling you is that not a lot of people are buying RIM BlackBerry devices, and a lot of people are buying uh, iOS phones, uh, iPhone 4Ss right now. So although that's, Hmm. I'm wondering, uh, I don't think this is including tablets. Uh, Yeah, so... Smartphone users, I don't. I'm pretty sure it's not including tablets in that mark. So sure, it's uh, it's interesting to watch the sort of Android iOS battle as they kind of wave back and forth. 
So, speaking of which, uh, one of the rumors that's been going around, and the most substantial version of the rumor I found up at the Wall Street Journal, is apparently Google is going to market its own tablet. And that's about all I'm going to say about that one. <laughs> do you, do, well, my question is, do you think this is why they bought Motorola? I can't decide if this is why they bought Motorola or if they looked at what they had at Motorola and figured, why don't we take this and turn it into uh, – uh, the next Nexus One, <laughs> uh, hopefully, you know, more successful than than the Nexus One. Um, because the, the story, the story does say that Samsung partners such as Samsung and ASUS will be responsible for the hardware. These people right. said so. Mm. Well, it, it's interesting because when you talk about hardware, it's it's always interesting to see who's out there. I wouldn't be, I, I you know, I I I'd still. I still look at the Motorola purchase and think that that was about patents and positioning themselves in the patent battles with Microsoft and, and IBM and, and everybody else on the planet that's a gigantic uh, consumer-facing internet or, or you know, uh, software or hardware firm. Um, you know, but they're talking about, you know, the Wall Street Journal order talks about a co-branded tablet that there's going to be uh, uh, delivered by uh, Asus. You talked about Samsung being one of the builders. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the article basically says due to its, the, they're producing tablets due to its pending 12.5 purchase of uh, $12.5 billion purchase of Motorola. You know, maybe they just decided, Hey, you know, let's help Motorola out. Let's throw the Google brand on there and see if that helps sell tablets, uh, in the stores. I, I really think that this is a kind of a necessary step, yeah. um, to create this kind of reference tablet that they you know, that they do with the phones. Uh, and I, I think it will actually help them push to create products and have their partners create products. They could really compete with the iPad, uh, which they don't have a lot of direction right now. That's kind of like, the, that was the problem with the initial wave of uh, Android smartphones, I feel. And I feel like that's the problem with the initial wave of the, of the Android-based tablets mm -hmm. too. So maybe, maybe this will help. Give them, give them a target to aspire to and then to <laughs> exceed, right? That's, yeah. that's what they need. Well, certainly, like Google's, I think, really frustrated with uh, Amazon's uh, uh, the Kindle Fire. It, I, right. It, yeah, I, I think you pretty much nailed it on the head. It'll it'll be interesting to see what they do with Motorola and if they do deliver their own branded tablet. Um, if you've ever had to buy a GPU or a hard drive or a monitor or a flat panel, and uh, you're not a Costco member, and Costco doesn't really sell much in the way of GPUs. Uh, so you head to Best no. Buy. <laughs> Best Buy, I think it's going to be rough. Best Buy, apparently the fourth quarter sales were a mess. Best Buy is clothing 50 stores, and I'm really curious to see whether or not Best Buy is going the way of uh, CompUSA and Circuit City. So, you know, 50, 50 stores isn't a lot given the number of stores they have, but... Uh, uh, Does it say how many stores they had? That's what I was curious about. Um, um, do, 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 do. I don't see anywhere in there. It says they're closing 50 of the big box stores, but they're going to open 100 of the Best Buy mobile stores. Right. This is interesting because in our in, in, in Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, we actually have a Best Buy in Florence, and then we have a Best Buy mobile at the mall, like within a mile of each other. And uh, it's it's interesting to see them kind of compete in that uh, specific of a market, right? This is, it's you know, you talk about Intel winning in the cell phone market. Trust us, Best Buy wants to be your only go-to guy for the cell phone business right. sales as well. So I, I agree with you though. I, I think this kind of, you know, I, I am one of those people that complains about not having a, a, a real PC, PC shop near me. Um, we have a micro center that's a, somewhere around an hour north of us. And I would love to have something closer. Right. But I, I don't think there's enough people buying those types of components. Uh, and even obviously enough people buying stuff at Best Buy anymore, like TVs and laptops and, and, and games and game consoles uh, to, to, to support that, to support that kind of business model anymore. Um, it's sad. It's sad yeah. to see. It is. Uh, and it, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes, because uh, I, I got to say, it's been more and more frustrating over the last couple of years as Best Buy has spent so much time, uh, you know, doing the upsell 
the side sell? Do you want a warranty? Do you want this? Can I sell yeah. you this? Do you want that? Can I set this up for you? Can I set someone? Can a genius set this up for you? And it's like, dude, sell me I, the I know, expletive widget and let me go home. I know so what I can they're trying it. to do. Yeah, and that's <laughs> I know I know desperately what they're trying to do. They're they're just trying to make more money, and it's hard to really fault them for that. But I went to buy an iPad three, and I had the same thing. I couldn't just go buy an iPad three. They had right. them in stock. You had to go wait in line, and then they took you through this like. You had to go through this accessories tour through the separate room <laughs> right before they wouldn't even let you have it, right? They'd just give you a piece of paper until you went through this room and they told you about how great the Apple TV was and right. here's our Geek Squad warranty and uh, have, you, have you tried these uh, cases or maybe you want a screen right. cover and we'll install it for you. And I was, you know, it, was, it made a, what should have been a, a 45 second ordeal, I would like iPad, please let me use my credit card right. into a 45 minute ordeal of waiting in line behind people. And it, it totally ruins the 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 buying experience for me and it makes me not want to go back there yeah that's so. that's basically where i am like not only did they spend 15 minutes trying to sell me uh features you know basically less on the accessories more on the insurance and other items that don't really pan out for the for when i bought the iphones for my wife and i um but they also managed to somehow promise me my bill wouldn't change and then i got my first bill and it's 50 dollars higher uh, that it should be. <laughs> and I'm sitting nice. there and I'm like, okay, now I got to go through and figure out a third time what I thought I signed up for. You asked before, uh, how many stores does Best Buy operate? Um, across all the different formats, according to the, the, the corporate, uh, uh, investor relations page up at Best Buy, 4,100 stores in multiple formats, uh, 1,200 square foot Best Buy mobile stores, as well as 20,000, 30,000, and 45,000 square, square foot Best Buy big box stores. Uh, then they also have the Future Shop stores and Canadian Best Buy stores, uh, averaging 26 and 32,000 square feet. And they have Carphone Warehouse and the Phone House stores, which are little tiny 800 square foot stores uh, over there. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because they have like an entire portfolio uh, you can read that that allows you to start uh, breaking down the sort of historical, mm. yeah, historical store count and retail square footage spreadsheet. So if you want to spend, there's 1,100 U.S. Best Buy stores, five Magnolia Audio and Video stores, uh, 35 Pacific Sales uh, Kitchen and Bath Centers, which basically Pacific Sales is a regional. Um, uh, appliance uh, seller that I first saw up here in Northern California. And then there's another 200 Best Buy mobile stores. So that's, and so basically 1,340 U.S. stores, which is probably down by 50 now. Um, hmm. And then another 2,846 worldwide between uh, Future Shop, Canadian Best Buy, Best Buy Europe, Five Star, China Best Buy, Best Buy Mobile, Mexico Best Buy, Turkey Best Buy, and Canada Geek Squad <laughs> standalone stores. There you have it, <laughs> including 45, 58,000 square foot Best Buy stores in the United States. And that is more than I really intended for us to talk about on Best Buy. <laughs> and I'd like to apologize to everybody who's been so patient. So, yeah, 50 stores out of 4,100, not a big deal. 50 stores out of 1,100 in the U.S., a slightly bigger deal. Um, you know, I, I don't want to see anybody out of a job. Sure. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, maybe Best Buy will start actually focusing on making us happy and making me want to go back to Best Buy and taking, making me want to just kick things when I walk out the door or make you want to kick things when you walk out the door. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, you want to, you want to, let's, let's maybe get to today's sponsor and jump to a few emails Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. We want to uh, thank our good friends at Netflix this week for sponsoring This Week in Computer Hardware. Now, if you, if you listen to our show every week, which obviously you do, and we appreciate that, by the way, uh, you know, you hear us talk about Netflix. And I can tell you from, from firsthand experience this week on this sp specific trip that I am on that Netflix helps me out a lot with its uh, ability to instantly stream TV shows and movies. Uh, it, it saves you time. It saves you hassle. It saves you money. And it adds a whole lot of convenience to, to a certain a lot of situations. I'm on vacation. I don't really know the TV channels. Nothing's really on. I don't feel like figuring that kind of stuff out. So, you know, I'm here with nine other people. They're watching something else. I can pull out my laptop and I can watch instant streaming TV shows and movies on Netflix really easily. It's, uh, it's super simple to do. You can watch it on your P PC or your Mac or your iPad. Uh, you can watch it on your iPhone. You can watch it on um, quite a few Android phones now as well. If uh, you want to watch it on your TV, you can hook it up through an Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii. 
Uh, there are Roku boxes, Apple TVs. Check your TV or your DVD player, your Blu-ray player. You may already have support for Netflix streaming on there, which is uh, which is really nice. With Netflix, you can watch TV and movie TVs. TV shows and movies instantly using any of those devices. You can begin watching a movie or show on one device and then finish it on a different one or even on a different day. So if I started watching um, a movie late night, fell asleep, I can start it from that same position the next day and finish it in the morning. I can finish it on my phone on the way to the golf course or whatever it is you want to do. It's Netflix is all about simplicity and convenience in, uh, in how you watch TV and movies. Um, and the best thing about this is you can actually try out the service completely free for 30 days. And all you have to do is go to netflix.com slash twit. Uh, use that URL when you sign up for the free trial. It's com- like I said, it's completely free for 30 days. You can cancel if you don't want it and you owe nothing. Um, it, but I don't think you're going to run into that issue. This is, this is the way people will watch TV in the future, but you can try it today. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is how everything should work. Instant, on demand, easy, pretty much anywhere. We need everybody else to sign up for it so that, 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 that the TV producers and the movie producers understand that this is the way things are going to work. And you can help do that and you can uh, make things easy on yourself by going to netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware and the entire Twit network. And we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Yay, Netflix. Should we say a handful of emails? I love emails. <laughs> Do you want to start with uh, Edward's affinity issues? It seems to be a, a round of affinity issues between Edward and Chris. Should we start with that? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. We'll we'll, we'll knock these out. We got an email okay. from Edward last week who said, "I decided I wanted to create a super cheap affinity setup with my Dell Dimension E520. He's got a 5770 uh, for 45 bucks and did." St- Major destruction to fit it aside. After everything was done, only two monitors would work at a time. I discovered I needed an active DisplayPort adapter, but it costs like 50 bucks, and I don't want to spend more on an adapter than my whole graphics card. At the moment, one display shows up as analog disabled CRT, even though all are identical. Is there any way to get the three displays working? Thanks for any help. Edward, you are going to have to have that active display adapter. Now, $50 $50 seems uh, a little bit high. Um, now, when, when these adapters first came out, they were uh, pretty expensive. Actually, the first ones that came out when we were first started testing Affinity were $100, um, which was obviously not fun. Uh, if you go to Newegg, I'm, I'm, I'm here on Newegg now. Let's see what they have. You can get one for $26.99 from Newegg. It's uh, from Sapphire. It's just, it's, it's just a Sapphire-branded Active DisplayPort adapter. It's DisplayPort to DVI interface. It's twenty six ninety nine, and then you can get the VGA one. No, nope, I'm sorry, DisplayPort to DVI. The twenty six ninety nine or twenty nine ninety nine, and uh, that's about half the price of what you're considering. So that's probably going to be your best option. If you look around, you know, go to mono 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 price. Go to mono price. Dot com. I know it's one of Patrick's favorite uh, resellers for a lot of that kind of stuff. They're going to have active. Display port adapters as well. I don't know if they'll necessarily be any cheaper than this, but mm-hmm. they might. But uh, for AMD cards, including the 7000 series, you are going to have to have um, active want to run three displays. You are going to have to have active or you have to have a monitor that has display port input. Um, so that that is unfortunate. Now, the new GTX 680 from NVIDIA actually kind of gets around that. They actually with um you know, they but they have the advantage of coming in basically two years after AMD invented the technology and, and kind of fixing some of the of the uh, things for it. So, right. I am looking on here. Let's see. I think Chad there's DisplayPort to HD. Yeah, oh, uh, Chad was just actually showing on the on the feed uh, the mono price. You're looking at like twenty five to thirty dollars for Active DisplayPort to DVI adapters. So okay, yeah. Yeah, there's. I think I found. I think Mono Price has a, 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 a DisplayPort to VGA. It's Ooh. eighteen dollars. Um, I think it is active. 
Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's active. Yeah, so it does have a uh, 162 megahertz video DAC for analog video, analog VGA signal output. Yeah, so I mean you're you're talking half the price that you're that you're thinking, Edwards. So I hope that hope that helps you out. Uh, you want to read this question from from Chris as Absolutely. well, also kind of on the Infinity <laughs> subject. Chris says one other semi-related question. I've been actually disappointed with Infinity overall. When everything works right, it looks awesome, but 95 percent of the time I'm playing games in window on one monitor because of the bad game support for Ifinity or the hopes I need to jump through, excuse me, the hoops I need to jump through to make things work with multiple monitors. I've been debating tossing the three monitors out and going with one big 27 or 30 inch high resolution uh, 2560 by 1600 or 1440 display, but the prices are just insane. Yes, they are. Now that the iPad's been released with its high-resolution display, do you think there's a chance that the large-size, high-resolution LCDs for PCs will drop in price? If not, do you guys have any suggestions on a large 2560 by 1440 or 1600 display I should check out? Um, uh, to work kind of backwards on that one, um, the best deals I've seen on, on 27 or 30-inch uh, high-resolution monitors, I do not recommend. If you're going to buy a 32-inch flat panel, uh, and you want to spend three hundred bucks. Your basic option is is either going to be a thirty inch uh, HDTV or a computer monitor that looks like a thirty inch HDTV because it's a ten eighty p monitor. Ten eighty p is a great resolution um, for a fifty sixty inch television that's eight or nine feet away from you. But when you bring a ten eighty p monitor, you know, in arm's length, the death's length from you, it starts to look incredibly. The pixels just start looking huge, and that's why the high-end 27, 30-inch flat panels are running a considerably higher resolution. Um, mm -hmm. With the iPad, no, the iPad's not really the the the, the new iPad with its 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 uh, Retina display is not really going to help the the PC market slash the desktop. Um, nope. Uh, the desktop monitor for uh, OS 10 desktops for for uh, uh, Power Max. Um, the problem is, is that the majority of one there's 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 the the glass manufacturers, the HDTV manufacturers aren't making money. The glass manufacturers are not making money on on big monitors. They're making money on little tiny stuff. Um, when I say little tiny stuff, I mean iPads and mostly cell phones. That's where the majority of the cash is being made in the in the flat panel market these days. So the bigger the flat panel gets, the lower the yield is, the higher the resolution uh, for a given size. And thirty, you know, thirty inch running at twenty five sixty by fourteen forty or sixteen hundred is much higher resolution than ten eighty p. The lower the yield is going to be, and the demand simply isn't there, uh, which is really unfortunate. You know, mm -hmm. this is most people for most people at this point, a 21 or 24 inch monitor, a 22, 24 inch monitor running 1080p is an amazing improvement over the 17 or 19 uh, inch monitor they were running. And, right. you know, Ryan and I are both dying for a, you know, for a $500 <laughs> 30 inch 2560 yep. display. Best we've seen probably, or certainly best I've seen is, is uh, refurbished monitors from the Dell outlet, but they are few and far between. Something a little unusual. We actually got a video question this week. Hey, what's up, Ryan and Patrick? I just wanted to know if you guys think it would be cool to have some sort of uh, shroud or indication uh, on the underside of the graphics card here. Because if you ever notice, whenever you plug in or install a graphics card, all you ever really get to look at is the bottom part here and never the nice looking fan assembly or shroud. Um, so I would like the manufacturers of graphics cards to please add something on here that indicates what kind of a card it is um, or somehow engineer it to have the GPU uh, and the fan assembly and the heat sink all up on the top here so that when I look into my case um, I could see you know a nice looking graphics card rather than the same old PCB that I've been looking at for years so uh, what do you guys think of that idea and uh, thanks for listening to my question so the idea is of a custom PCB or the option for a custom shroud for a graphics card, because I think he actually has a, a, a motherboard inside of his PC that's already a white PCB instead of a green or a black. Mm. Mm. So I think I, this this is an idea that I, I've i I've often thought to myself, why did it do this? If you look at a video card, like the face of it, where the fan is and the uh -huh. cooler is, it's always really well designed and it's always very... Um, pretty looking and sometimes there's lights on it and that kind of stuff but when you 
if you're using that on an open test bed, that's great, right? You get to see that. When you install it in a case, and if you install it in a case with a window, mm-hmm. that all points down, right? It all points straight down, and you never <laughs> get to see that. You only kind of see the stripe of stuff along the, the top of the card as opposed to you always see what's on the back. Now, AMD's uh, 5000 series cards, I believe it was, had kind of a, a, a black shroud on the back, that looked cool, but it didn't have any particularly interesting designs on it. And I right. think he is spot on that this is like if you wanted to have LED lights or if you wanted to have uh, a cool logo and design or, or glowing text or something like that, that that's the place to do not uh, necessarily on the front. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Somebody just sent a link in the chat room. Uh, EVGA actually offers... It's kind of a, it looks like a stainless steel back plate that's held on with a bunch of uh, T6 torque screws to kind of clean up mm. the back of the card. So it's it's kind of funny if you click on there's a chat if you can click on there's a uh, a PDF link up there. It's basically you remove 16 screws on the back of the GTX 680. <laughs> then you remove the protective cover from the black the back plate and then you screw it back down with the 16 screws and you get this EVGA cut out ventilated kind of plate. I think this is probably one of those places where if you really want to do something custom, it's time to pull on your modder's hat and start experimenting with some of the options. Um uh, you know, it's it's I think it's time to go to the go to the garage, get the tools out and uh do a little customization on there. Cause the problem I is, think, is, I think the issue. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say because the problem is, is there's there's only a subset of people that are going to be really that you know a lot of cases are sold with glass sides, but a lot of the cases sold with glass sides look awful on the inside because it's just that was a cheap <laughs> computer case or because people are like, this is odd, and then they install their stuff and their cables look like a giant rat's nest. Um, and, and, you know, and, and then they shove that glass side of the case up against the wall so they can't see mm-hmm. it. But, um, I think there's the only, a, go ahead. The only issue is going to be is the, there, there's, they have room to, to expand down the, 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 right. the, the tolerance of the amount of space that they're allowed to have on the back of that card is probably pretty, pretty restrictive. Right. right. And, uh, depending on what, although MSI, that lightning card we just looked at today did have, a device like that on the back of it too. So <laughs> I think that's actually a really good idea. It's funny because you start looking at cards like if you if you're running Crossfire SLI, if you want to put an additional card in the case, man, sometimes start things start getting really snug when you start plugging multiple mm-hmm. cards in. Mm-hmm. So this is right. uh a question from Mike I think we've been trying to get to for a couple of weeks. He says, I'm currently running a laptop and a secondary 26-inch 1080p monitor. I'm building my first custom PC soon. Excellent. And don't want to go back to single screen, so I need something to replace the laptop screen. I happen to have a spare 17-inch widescreen monitor, and I'm considering using it in portrait mode. I quite like this idea for websites and documents. What are your thoughts on portrait monitors? Do graphics cards have good enough support for them? Are they worth the wall bracket or stand issues? I'm studying computer science, so I spend a lot of time coding and noticing how bad text looks up close on 1080p so i'm tempted by a super high res 26 inch monitor alongside my 1080p and leaving the 17 inch in its box i've moved mainly to console gaming so the newest games i play are five plus years old medieval 2 total war so i was planning on getting a low mid-range gpu and using the money i say i'm getting an i7 instead of an i5 what's the minimum card i would need to run a super high res and a 1080p monitor mike the, the 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 video card is is pretty much anything you want. Right. Any if if you're playing five if you're playing medieval total war, <laughs> any video card you're going to gonna be able to play it just fine. Uh, any card is gonna be on two D version, two D mode, and two at ten p or twenty five sixty by fourteen forty or whatever it is, uh, without without an issue. So I wouldn't worry too much about the video card. Um, I love the idea of portrait displays. I've been I've always been surprised by how much kind of a pain it is to find one that will do it correctly. Right. You have to have a particular stand. Uh, it has to be able to you know, slide up and down so that you can rotate it, or you have to be able to take the stand off and mount it to the wall that way. And so it, I, find it, I find it odd. I guess it's not odd, but some displays won't support portrait configurations. The graphics cards right. have no problem with it. Some, it's just the displays. It's, uh, it's kind of funny because I remember – a long time ago, uh, when I first started working in desktop publishing, um, back when computers still had stone keyboards, um, portrait monitors were a big deal because the 
you were at a point where VGA was pretty common, like 640 by 480, and, and the monitors were just starting to get into to, to XVGA to 10, 1024 by 768. And mm-hmm. for a lot of people, the only way they could do legal documents or word process uh, the way they had traditionally done it with, with paper was to basically have these big, and there were some amazing, I, I, I'm pretty sure you've seen some of Orion where you would look like, you would hear these giant grinding noises as you turned your 55 pound CRP 90 degrees into a, into a vertical, <laughs> a portrait arrangement. And you would pull those apart and there would these be these insane acts of engineering with external or internal contacts. And you'd just be looking at this mess. Um, I got a lot. By the time they got to uh, LCD flat panels, you know, you basically it showed up on professional monitors, but not consumer monitors. Because again, it was like who's using this? Lawyers, people who spend all their time in, in Word documents, or 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 uh, you know, not so much Photoshop, but but desktop publishing. And mm-hmm. now it's even getting you know, there's still like a, I can, you know, there's still a real split. Like professional monitors from Dell seem to have it the consumer monitors don't a lot of consumer monitors from other companies uh don't offer that option and it's a man i gotta say mike i would go with the i would spend the money if if you're you know if you're spending a lot of time coding and you know working in that kind of a nightmare environment where you've got big screens full of text and you're you're looking back and forth get the high resolution monitor Take the time to set up the ergonomics on your workspace that you've got the correct distance, that your eye height is at the right level on the monitor, your keyboards at the appropriate level and, and under your desk on a tray, and you've got something supporting your feet, you've got a decent chair. Because, you know, you start coding 12 hours a day, which everybody seems to do, um, you're just going to tear your body apart. So do yourself a favor and start taking care of it now, starting with your eyeballs. Um, and uh, I would I would walk away from the 17 inch flat panel, I would turn that into something like a music station where, where that's like your MP3 box attached to your stereo or something and, and get the high resolution monitor and take care of your eyes. Um, <laughs> cause man, uh, you know, you're in school, you're young, you're bulletproof and suddenly you're 35 and squinting and going, what happened? <laughs> uh, and then there's, it's an interesting, obviously the, the gunner optics people, Obviously, they want to sell you their glasses, um, which do some really interesting thing. But one of the things that um, they quote that is not from from Gunner Optics, but is from uh, uh, optometrists from ophthalmological ophthalmological societies. That's a hard word to say. Um, is that the way we're using our eyes today? Because we're spending so much time staring at a fixed distance at screens, we are really not doing. Uh, our eyes any favors and that they're seeing the kind of um, degeneration of, 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 I want to say macular optics, but I don't want to use the jargon wrong and, and get a bunch of angry email next week. <laughs> Basically like we <laughs> are late. artificially by staring at a single fixed distance that is essentially closer than your eyes were designed to focus at for long periods of time. We're accelerating the way our eyes age and that they're running into the kind of stuff that you used to have to be 40 to have problems with is starting to show up uh, at extraordinarily young ages. So, Great news for me. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it, dude. <laughs> but for those of you who have not destroyed your eyes yet, uh, start taking care of them now and, and start taking care of your body now, especially if you spend a lot of time typing, a lot of time staring at a monitor um, so that you'll still be able to do all the stuff you like to do, like play video games and watch movies when you are old and gray or bald <laughs> like I am. So <laughs> on that bright and cheerful note, outside of the big game on Saturday, the Kentucky Louisville game, what's coming up on PCPer.com, Ryan? Uh, we have a couple of new motherboards coming up. I know we have an X79 motherboard, and we're going to start taking a look at Z77 motherboards Ooh. next week as well. So if you are interested in that kind of uh, next generation chipset from Intel, it will be it will be the first to offer integrated US first Intel chipset to offer integrated USB 3.0. So we're going to see how that kind of compares to other implementations, and uh, we'll be able to do some Sandy Bridge plus 77Z testing so we'll be able to nice. we'll be able to use ivy bridge with z77 but we can use sandy bridge with z77 starting next week Very so cool. uh, we're looking forward to that so uh the thursday show this week on techzilla was all dedicated to backing up uh saturday Good. uh march 31st is world backup day don't be an april fool back up today um <laughs> so it's, it started it's kind of funny it started as a reddit thread and then turned into this this movement to have a world backup day to remind everybody to back up so we did a whole special on backing up and then uh next week uh 
Uh, if it comes in, we may have a certain flame-proof, waterproof, dog-proof, cat-proof external uh, drive raid enclosure uh, mm-hmm. from the mm-hmm. IOSafe people, uh, which hopefully that's nice. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, I'm very excited about that one. Having done all sorts of horrible things to their uh, uh, portable drives, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, cleaning your keyboard, which is something. Uh, Ugh. Oh no Ugh. no no. No, no, we have we have space goop, <laughs> cyber goop. I have I, ha- I have some of that actually. I, I it was funny we did not mention that in our spring cleaning episode, and I got this really fervent email from someone who is not employed by that company because we played around with it a while ago, and it's it's one of those things where you have to get over your disgust at handling the substance. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like slime. It's it's yeah, it's like something out of a Nickelodeon cartoon. But <laughs> this guy is like, it is amazing. I use it. To deal with the foul, because apparently he's dealing with some really foul clients in his office or something, uh, or some really foul keyboards. I'm sure the clients there are lovely go. people. Exactly. But, uh, so we, we will have slime and flame-proof hard drive enclosures next And week. don't forget, everybody, to send us your emails, right? Twitch at twit.tv, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. We need your questions uh, for next week and beyond. Yes, we do. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening today. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. You know, uh, you know what's funny, Patrick, is I did a – on Thursday, we did that live review or uh-huh. whatever. Um and we had people complain because I was using a MacBook Pro to, like, control some of the cameras. <laughs> and they were like, why are you using a Mac computer? Blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, okay, so fine. I did exactly what you have there. As I went during one of the breaks, <laughs> I went and took gaff tape and I put it over the Apple sticker on the back. And then I got comments of, like, why would you cover up the Apple logo? <laughs> that and I was doesn't like, you know what? Familiar. I'm tired of all of you people. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it is what it is, man. <laughs> never going to please everybody. You're never going to please most everybody, as it seems.